Good day, peoples. Well, I haven't been getting the response that I'd hoped for. And the cosmic expansion model, uh, this is not a theory. It's not my idea. It's not a hypothesis. It is a fact. It is a formal, concise, mathematical proof. So hopefully this will be a concise summary that will convey solid, clear understanding that Einstein's relativity is a fraud. We'll just focus on this one point in the pound Rebka experiment. You can follow along in the wiki article. Uh, please do. And I will demonstrate to you how and why it's approved, how anybody can clearly understand it and see that. Uh, hopefully, if you have a uh, at least one freshman physics class and one advanced algebra class, you should be able to see this clearly for yourself. And if my explanations to date haven't been all that good, well, let's just hope this will be adequate. So this is the cosmic expansion model and cause of gravity by Al Foos, that's me. And uh, maybe my qualifications, I should focus on those a little bit. Uh, of course, if I had a, a degree or a PhD in, in physics, I probably wouldn't be able to do this. I'd be too brainwashed because, well, anyway, um, I thought I had money for the university and it turns out that it wasn't there when I needed it. So I volunteered for combat, army infantry in 1968, January. And I was told then at the time, only one in a hundred was coming back. So don't plan on it. A friend of mine I went in with, he came back in a plastic bag a few months later, but I put in four months of training military training. And so I risked getting killed in Vietnam for that education, 150 bucks a month. And back then, it wasn't enough to even eat on, let alone pay tuition. And when I got out, I had nowhere to live. Uh, I took extremely ill. I had no money to eat, no money to live. And so my grades did suffer. But after a few years, I got back in the swing of it. And even though I was near starving all the time, I put in uh, at least a minimum of 16 hours a day, taking the hardest science and math classes I could and solving hard problems every day for hours and hours and hours and hours without a break. It wasn't about theories and it wasn't about ideas or hypotheses. I just solved problems. And I recognized in about 1972 that uh, the Einstein stuff that was definitely something seriously wrong there. And uh, so, um, you know, I put that aside. And when I had time, from time to time, I'd work on this thing a little bit. So we're going to examine this experiment and uh, show you that it is a hoax obviously perpetrated by the government and media. So when you hear about Einstein's been verified, his theory has been verified again and again and again and again, you know it's a lie. And I'm gonna to demonstrate to you in this one particular case, we haven't got time to address everything, but they're all the same. It's all empty air, blue shift, bull shift. Anyway, okay, so, um, I'm going to take a break. I'll be right back. Thanks. Well, let's do a very quick review on Doppler shift of light again. And by now, uh, I, I would recommend looking at my last video. This is uh, kind of part two. It's a summary, and it's just going to hit the high points and focus right in on those. And hopefully, I won't get tongue tied and off track like I, I tend to do. And um, so first of all, let's examine this illustration here. This is a Doppler redshift. It isn't quite red yet, is it? It's just shifted towards the red from the blue. It's uh, a yellow color. 
And we've got two moons out here, and we've got light traveling between them. And we know from basic physics, of course, that objects of mass will uh, have a shift associated with them, a Doppler shift. Well, the physicists say it isn't a Doppler shift. They say it's a, a gravitational shift. But at any rate, here we've got two moons out here, and we've got a, a Doppler shift, well, a gravitational shift. It's actually a Doppler shift, even though they appear to be fixed. And just to illustrate that this does occur. So let's go to the uh, next one. And then the next one, we've got the Earth over here. And this is just a hypothetical. Let's just say that the Earth is receding away faster because it has greater mass. Uh, we don't actually see that, but let's just assume that two objects are receding away faster and it'll shift from the yellow to the orange and then to the blue. Because as things recede away from each other, the path of light is stretched out. Okay, uh, this isn't actually conceptualized quite right, but we're gonna talk about that more. All I want you to do now is to understand how this Doppler shift business works. You understand that, right? Okay, hopefully. Otherwise you won't get anything at all. So get this under your belt. And in the next uh, illustration here, we're gonna get right down to business and study this wiki article on the pound Repka experiment because it's both a revelation of the Einstein fraud, and it's also the path to understanding what's actually going on here. We're gonna prove that there is a solution, a factual solution, a proof, and not a theory. So anyway, um, this is what we actually see between say the earth and the moon. We see a, a uh, blue shift, coming away. Well, it's actually a red shift coming away, isn't it? It starts out blue, but the light's coming in. It's shifting towards the blue as it comes in. The um, waves squeeze together as if things were moving together, but the distance is fixed. See, we know that the distance is fixed, but it looks as if there, there, there could be a Doppler shift towards the blue coming in and towards the red coming out. This is our common gravitational redshift, the physicists or cosmologists call it. Now, the point of the pound Rebke experiment, assuming that it had a real result and it wasn't fudged, but back in the 70s, 72 and later, um, the one thing that I came away with was an understanding that there was such a thing as a gravitational redshift. And the point of the, uh, and also the point of the pound Rebke experiment being that along with the blue shift coming closer to Earth, the lower, the closer to Earth you get, the slower the clock runs. So clock speeds, clocks run more slowly as you get closer to the Earth, in addition to the fact that there is this blue shift of light. And if the clock runs more slowly, you know that a meter is going to be somewhat shorter because how do we define a meter? A natural definition, denatural definition. And you know this from your coursework, don't you? A meter is defined as a certain number of wavelengths over the certain period of time. So if the clock is running more slowly, the meter won't be as long. It'll still be a meter locally, but if you're looking at it as we are in the illustration here, we're a remote viewer, we see that the clock is running more slowly and we see that as a result, the meter has to be somewhat shorter. Length has to be somewhat shorter. And this is very important. They don't say much about it in the experiment, in the wiki article, but that was the point of it, to prove that clock speed was slower. And we're talking about the same light Actually, the wavelength of light locally is the same throughout, all the way from the Earth to the moon. Even though a remote observer will see it shifting towards the red, if you're riding along with the wave, you won't notice any difference whatsoever. You won't notice any difference in clock speed or length. See? 
because to you it's all the same. The clock is running more slowly, the meter is somewhat shorter, but you're somewhat shorter. Everything is, well, as you move away from the earth, things get longer and the clock runs faster. Is that understood? Does that make sense to you? Because this isn't my idea, this isn't my theory. These are the guts of physics, you understand? A meter is a meter only insofar as there are a certain number of wavelengths over a certain interval of time. So a remote observer will see as light is leaving the earth that the clock is running somewhat faster, the meter is somewhat longer and light shifts towards the red. Those are fundamental aspects of each other. So this is a fact. It's just a basic fact of physics. I didn't make it up, but locally, these changes are not apparent. And what I'm trying to get at here is, is as the meter is long, longer, farther out from the earth, that this actually is cosmic expansion, not cosmic expansion where the raisins, the distance between the raisins is getting larger, but where space as a whole is getting larger. Raisins are getting larger and the space between them is getting larger. So the meter stick gets longer, the clock runs a little faster. These are observations, basic observations that were purported to prove Einstein's theory of relativity. They do nothing of the sort. And that's what I wanna emphasize here. This equation here that I'm showing you is Einstein, well, in the wiki article, this is supposedly the change in clock speed is proof of Einstein's theory of relativity. And this equation here is Einstein's relativity. Uh, do you see anything about clock speed in there? No. <laughs> and you don't see it anywhere in the article other than in the introduction where it says this is proof of reduced clock speed at lower elevations. What this... Um, I don't want to be vulgar or anything, but anyway, what this equation of Einstein's is supposedly presenting you with is that there is a change in fractional frequency. In other words, there's a blue shift. So the frequency of the receiver is equal to the frequency of the emitter times the ratio of this perfect mess here. And it is a mess. It doesn't have any meaning whatsoever. The whole point of it is to make you believe in, oh my gosh, this guy is a genius. Look at this equation. But it really doesn't mean anything. And we're going to keep talking about that. So please pay attention. I went through this briefly, and I could see that the units did cancel out, right? But the G that's in here, this has to do with, this is actually Newton's G, uh, another plagiarism by Einstein. He calls it his cosmological constant, but it's Newton's G, that's all it is. And it applies, it's useful for describing the force of attraction between two bodies of mass. But we only have one body of mass here, the earth, <laughs> you see? So it doesn't mean anything at all. And the point of the experiment, of course, is to see how much clock speed and frequency will change over the interval h, height. Okay, so we have two different levels. We have a potential energy, and we're going to see the clock speed changes over that distance, that frequency changes over that distance. But right now, this is the only thing that they put forward by Einstein, actually. And um, then they turn around and throw it around, throw it right out. They say, this is Einstein's equation. We've proved it. We've proved the clock speed is shorter, even though clock speed isn't in there, but we're gonna throw it out because H is negligent in his formula. <sighs> what? Now, tell me that isn't a fraud. Okay, at first they're gonna prove it, but they don't prove it, and then they flush the equation down the toilet. Yeah, shuck and jive, little shell game. It's always like that. This constant media hype about, oh, we just proved Einstein. Uh, 
And this was one of the initial critical experiments that was taught. Oh, Einstein's relativity, proof. Okay, you can see it isn't proof of anything. They just turn around and throw it away. They flush it down the toilet. And then they put this little equation out here. This actually, they make it appear to be a calculus differential equation. This is not a differential equation. What they should be saying here is not little delta E, but big capital delta E divided by the initial energy is equal to, well, this is a potential energy formula. It's just a rephrasing of Newton's potential energy formula. So basically they're just using Newton here. It has nothing to do with relativity or Einstein. And uh, they come up with a figure and, and it matches what the experiment showed them. So this is proof of Einstein. But we were supposed to be looking at clock speed. And all of a sudden H is back in the equation because really it isn't negligent, negligible, excuse me. It isn't negligible at all, is it? It's the crux of the whole issue. And if frequency changes, then they're looking for clock speed, right? So then they're trying to tell you that the change in frequency is proportional to a change in clock speed. So there's a blue shift, there's a change in clock speed, and of course, we know that there has to be a change in length as well. But they don't go into either clock speed or length after that at all. So back in the 70s, and this is, these are some equations I jotted down back in the 70s sometime. Because I could see that the clock speed was changing proportional to the change in potential energy. And that would be potential energy is the speed of a falling body over that interval. So the potential energy of a rock dropping 30 feet is going to be uh, proportional to a change in fractional uh, uh, frequency or a blue shift. It'll be a blue shift over that interval. And that blue shift is going to be proportional to a reduction in clock speed. They never get around to that, but that was the equation that I made back in the 70s because I could see this had to be true. There were numerous experiments that verified it, so there shouldn't be an argument there. That was the one thing you could come away with and feel secure about. So this equation here says that the um, clock speed will, the final clock speed will equal the initial clock speed minus the fractional change in clock speed over the interval gh uh, as a ratio to the total speed of light c squared. Speed of light squared, c squared. I don't want to get into this derivation. You can see the chapter. I'll, I'll try to remember to put a link up for it from my book where I actually derive these things bit by bit by bit. There isn't much to it. I mean, you just pull this stuff right out of, you know, it, anybody can do this. Anybody should be able to do it. I don't know why it seems I'm the only one who ever did, because I'm a very curious person and because I became very proficient in problem solving because of the extreme effort that I put into it over many, many years. So that's what I am. I'm a problem solver, not a theoretician. I don't come up with ideas. And by the way, the change in energy, which why why did they throw out clock speed and, and just focus on change in energy? Because they want to show here that Einstein has an explanation for this gravitational redshift, that there's a change in energy, an increase in energy, I guess. And of course, blue light does have, it is more energetic than red light. But understand that the light that is coming down, you know, it might be gaining energy in the sense that it's becoming blue, but it's losing energy in the sense that it is slowing down. It's losing kinetic energy, so it's a wash. There really is no change in energy. So this is just a dodge. They don't want you to get too close to the answer. Or maybe they didn't know it themselves. <laughs> Who knows? You know, I don't want to get into that. I just am assuring you and showing you conclusively that this is all a fraud, the Einstein stuff. 
But it is true that there's a change in clock speed. And you could say there's also, you could change R to L for change in length, and you could substitute F for change in frequency. And you all three of these things are a mash set. And all those things change together. And why is that important? Well, it's important because it shows that there is such a thing as cosmic expansion, not where the raisins are moving apart, but where everything is expanding. And we see that everything is expanded as we get farther and farther away from the Earth. That's the point of it. And I just didn't have any time to tinker with this. Life was tough for many, many years. And um, I've been uh, in a different country for several years now. And I've had time to refocus my thoughts on this issue. So this is the only time, OK, what have they spent, billions? of dollars and written thousands of articles to about Einstein's genius and how all this came out. It's, it's not true. None of it's true. And Lewis Essen, who should have gotten a PhD, or excuse me, he should have gotten a Nobel Prize for uh, inventing the atomic clock and finding the correct speed of light. He was actually threatened with the loss of his career for pointing out that all the Einstein stuff had no meaning to it at all. Other than possibly this change in clock speed and change in length, but they misapply and they misunderstand and they misrepresent. But we're going to get that straight. And that's what I want you to know. I'm, I don't have the best qualifications in the world, but this is the only place that you will find the truth. This is the only chance that science has to recover from this black hole that Einstein and his relativity has put us into. Because relativity doesn't mean anything. There was no Big Bang. But anyway, OK, so instead of using a small delta here, I use correctly use the large delta. And I come up with these formulas showing that change in clock speed or change in length or change in frequency between two heights, two over a distance h of uh, potential energy. The point of it being, though, that I want you to grasp is that as light leaves the Earth, space expands, the wavelength gets longer, and the frequency of light diminishes. Yardsticks are somewhat longer. longer clock speeds run somewhat faster. If this is boring to you or I'm making a boring, please understand you know, how important this is. You know, this is the holy grail of physics. This is what physics should be all about. It's not my idea. These are facts based on the experiment and known facts of physics. That's all. Didn't make it up. Okay, anyway, let's go to um, another illustration here. Well, let's stop, I guess, and, and think about this. Am I making sense? Because there isn't all that much to this. It, it is hard to grasp at first, but once you get used to it, once you see it, and once you know it, once you understand it, and if you have, like I say, if you have for God's sakes, if you have a degree in mathematics or a lot of mathematics and science under your belt, university math, of all people, you should be able to see this clearly and recognize that I'm telling you the truth. Nowhere else in history have you heard it before. Not There may have been other people, but they weren't heard. And I'm trying to get your attention. So anyway, let's go on to the next illustration here well this is going to be our summary this is going to be a short video okay this is all we have to say about it isn't it mm, well not quite not quite um let's go back here to this um
let's let's look at this little animation that I've done here. It may help explain explain it. If the moon and the earth are fixed in relation to each other, it's not because they aren't moving apart, if you understand. It's just that as everything is expanding, the meter sticks are expanding along with it. So everything looks fixed. But that doesn't mean it isn't expanding. Inside the box, everything inside the box is expanding. So everything that's inside the box doesn't know that it's expanding. It wouldn't matter how much it shrunk or how much it expanded everything inside the box. All the known laws of physics would be exactly the same and nobody would be the wiser. But it is expanding. And this is the kind of expansion that we're talking about. So if we go back, well, let's look at this animation here, of course. If we have a five ball, a six ball, and a nine ball, and they have mass five, six, and nine, mass units of five, six, and nine, then the six ball will be expanding faster than the five ball, and the nine ball will be expanding faster than the six ball. They'll look like they're fixed in distance from us, but they're actually expanding. And the way that we see this and the way that we know this is that the five ball doesn't shift that much towards the red, but the six ball shifts a little more because expansion is proportional to mass. And the nine ball has an even greater red shift because it has a mass of nine. And so it's moving in the cosmic sense. It's receding away. Everything is receding away from each other at a rate. It might not look like it in this animation, but the nine ball would be receding faster than the six and the six faster than the five but it would look fixed to you. So inside our box, our physical dimension, everything stays the same, even though the cosmos as a whole is expanding because the universe has mass and the universe is expanding. And this is how things are expanding, not the distance between the raisins. So you can take this meter stick, even though it, shrinks or lengthens depending on the strength of gravitational field that it's in you can put it in a black hole it'll still be a meter and the distance of the radius and yes the universe has a radius that radius is fixed it'll always be the same no matter how much the universe as a whole expands now i think i explained this really well in some of my prior videos. Please go back and look at those if you haven't already. The last one especially, which I'll call out part one. Because this is just supposed to be a summary. I don't want to go on and on about it like I have in, in other cases. So the rate of recession, well, expansion is a property of mass then, isn't it? You won't see the expansion. You see the expansion in terms of the redshift of light because light isn't affected by the expansion it's telling you the true distance that doppler shift tells you how, how fast things are receding away from you even though they look fixed according to your instruments in the cosmic level they are receding away from you and this is the fact that we can see clearly from the results of the pound repka and other similar experiments. That's the proper interpretation. It's not my idea. It's not a hypothesis. It's a fact. It's what the experiments are telling you. That's what they're telling you. But so you see there's a, a greater redshift in proportion to mass, but there's something else that we have to deal with, and that's gravity. In this illustration here in this animation, we have uniform motion, different rates depending on different masses. Everything looks fixed in your, in your frame of reference, even though it's actually expanding. And that's what the redshift is telling you. It's a Doppler shift. 
It's not a gravitational shift, although it's proportional. The rate of recession is proportional to mass because expansion is a property of mass. But it's a little bit more complicated than that. And what we want to talk about is gravity. So, so we'll uh, talk here a little bit about um, um, what would happen if what would happen if the expansion because free expansion that's just things drifting apart, isn't it? We would never see any difference in our sphere of reference in our box. We would never see any difference. We would never know any difference if the light weren't telling us that things were expanding because of the degree of redshift. But we have this other problem called gravity. Okay, so how do we explain gravity? Um, well, I'll tell you, let's do a summary of everything that we've talked about so far. And I'm going back to the prior videos where I've explained gravity very, very well. And maybe I didn't explain it all that well, but we're gonna take another look now, a brief look. And so I've made up this summary illustration here. And um, if you look at this, we've got everything that's really important to know here on one page and we can talk about this. Let's talk about this on the right here, this curve that goes from the blue to the red. That's light leaving the earth. It doesn't just leave the earth, shift it towards the red. It has a, it accelerates. And as it accelerates, the, you know, the wavelength gets longer. It accelerates and it gets longer. So this isn't just uniform recession. This is accelerating expansion. Yeah, if we were outside the box and we were able to look inside, we would see that the Earth is expanding. And the moon out here is expanding a little bit too. Well, let's just say that the moon isn't in orbit. Let's just say there's a body falling towards the Earth. It so happens that the rate of this falling body is exactly equal to the rate of increase, the acceleration of light leaving the Earth. That's no coincidence. That's in the pound Rebka experiment. That's what it's telling you. Think. That's exactly what it's saying. That as light, as light leaves the Earth, it shifts towards the red, it stretches out. Space is expanding at the very same rate that bodies are accelerating towards the earth. That's not an accident. It's not gravitational redshift, but it is the cause of gravity because you don't see it being here inside the box. But matter is expanding in an accelerating way. Of course, that it tapers off very rapidly. We know that because of Newton's uh, the force of gravity diminishes with the square of the radius from the distance of two bodies. So we know that it's going to taper off very rapidly, but it still it accelerates rapidly at first. And then it tapers off as it gets farther away from the Earth. So the Earth is expanding in an accelerating fashion. And that expansion actually causes the reverse retrograde, retrograde motion, the reverse force of gravity, because an acceleration outwards is a force. Uniform expansion isn't a force. And what does Newton's third law tell you? Newton's third law, it's not a hypothesis, it's not a idea, it's not a guess, it's a law, it's a fact. Every action produces an equal and opposite 
reaction. So the force of expansion, think about it. You're sitting on top of this earth and it's expanding. It's You're stuck to it. It's not so much that you're falling down. Actually, Einstein said this at some point. I don't want to get into that. I think, you know, I think the guy was half senile or something. I really don't know. It's really hard to understand this guy. But at any rate, the force of expansion outwards is what produces the equal and opposite force of gravity. It's a fact. I didn't make it up. It isn't an idea. It isn't a theory. It isn't a guess. It's a mathematical fact. It's based on Newton's law of gravity, what we see happening with redshift and length of meters and the pound Rebke experiment and numerous other experiments. It's a fact. There's just nobody telling it to you. You're hit with so much bullshit from all directions. And Einstein said this, and Einstein did that, and it's all complete nonsense. It's all made up. I don't know. It is got some kind of bullshit mill out there or something. It's just <laughs> churning out this propaganda. This is the truth. Pay attention. If you're interested in this stuff, <laughs> tell somebody I didn't make it up. It isn't my idea. I just happened to sit down and think about it long enough to actually finally be able to articulate what I more or less always knew. So before I die, I wanted to leave this as sort of a legacy. So people understood what really is going on. Not my idea, not a guess, it's a fact. Okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit more about this. This is our falling body on the left and light that's, of course, it doesn't have a blue shift or red shift. It's not light, but it actually is increasing in velocity, a falling body, in exactly the opposite way that light is accelerating out because space is expanding outwards. But you don't see it because you're inside the box. You're part of the expansion. It's a fact. That's what the experiments tell you. Please understand it. Please let people know that somebody out here actually knows the truth. They've penetrated through the lies and they've come up with the truth. Okay, so the Doppler shift at over a short distance near the surface of the earth is about the opposite. The Doppler shift, if you were to use the Doppler formulas, it would come out to be a shift of about 9.8 meters per second, which is the rate of falling bodies in the opposite direction. Isn't that amazing? And you really don't think that was an accident, do you? You really think that Einstein explained this? Okay, I'm explaining it to you correctly here. But there's more I want you to be able to understand because light isn't just, read some more of that article. They talk about how the photons are shot out like cannons from the atom. <laughs> no, that's not true. Look at the diagram and see what's going on here. The increase in space, the increase in the meter is actually equal to the change in wavelength of the light. What does that tell you? It tells you the expansion of space is what is propagating light. It isn't getting shot out of a cannon. It's being pushed by the expansion of space and matter because that is the fundamental property of matter. Expansion of matter and space. It makes more space as it expands. Even though matter is almost entirely empty space, so it's expanding into a infinite fixed dimension and pushing light ahead of it. And that's why the Michelson and Morley experiment says that light 
travels at the same velocity in all directions. It doesn't say anything about Einstein. It doesn't prove Einstein's relativity. It proves that space is expanding in all directions at the same time. Light is being propagated in all directions at the same time. And that's why its velocity is exactly the same in all directions at the same time as proved by Michelson and Morley experiment. Do some research, you know, I'm not just throwing this stuff out here. You have to study about this a little bit. What did the Michael Morley experiment really mean? And I'll tell you, if you try to understand Einstein and you actually believe in it, you're gonna get yourself god awful confused because it is nonsense. It really is. Don't go there. Grab onto what I'm telling you and run with it and fix it in your mind so that you're immune from this propaganda, this brainwash. Okay, more. So expansion is proportional to the ambient density of matter in that region. The more matter, the more expansion, the faster the rate of expansion. And if expansion of the earth is responsible for the change in velocity of light as it pushes it out and it changes wavelength, then you can be certain that the universe as a whole is also expanding in proportion to its mass. And that can only be the baseline speed of light. <laughs> well, initially, that might sound crazy to you, but it's a mathematical fact. It's true. It has to be. If the Earth is expanding and a meter stick is growing and it's causing the light to accelerate, it's pushing light away, and that's what's propagating light then the universe as a whole is expanding at a rate proportional to the speed of light. It equals the speed of light. The rate of expansion is the speed of light. I made up. It isn't a hypothesis. It's the guess. If you think about it, and you work through a problem, and you know how to solve problems, that's the answer that you come out with. It's the only answer. So forgive me for not being the greatest speaker in the world, not being all that articulate, but I am telling you the truth. I am telling you the facts, not an idea. It's just one more problem I've solved among thousands and thousands that I've solved. I come up with the correct answer every time. Yeah, I got good grades when I finally got going. You know, I should have anyway. If, if I didn't get an A, it wasn't because I wasn't Mac acing the problems. I got them all right. Sometimes initially I'd spend many, many hours on one problem. Later, you know, nobody could keep up with me. You know, and the Hewlett Packard reverse Polish calculator was a great help back in the 70s. Anyway, so we see these relationships here defined. Uh, the expansion of space caused by matter. It causes the change in wavelength in the acceleration of light away from the earth. That's how we perceive it. And the reverse of that, every action creates an equal and opposite reaction. That's the force of gravity. Come on. You can understand that. All you get from the Einstein stuff is, well, ladies, Einstein said that, and it proves this, and it proves that flush your mind out of the brainwash and think for yourself for a change. Think about it. I paid, I made the path here. I blazed the trail. You can see that it's the truth. Okay, one other thing here that I wanted to talk about. Um, well, okay, let's talk about this redshift from point to point. Um, it's the same for bodies out in the galaxy, other stars that we see this redshift. The redshift is actually equal to the difference in rates of extend, expansion between the Earth, our location, and that distant star. Even though the distance is fixed by our reckoning in the cosmic sense, overall cosmic sense, space is expanding and those that potential energy that Change, that change, difference in rate of expansion is actually 
again, equal to the gravitational potential between those two points. That holds true anywhere in the universe. And if you read in my book a quote by um, Einstein, he was approaching his later years, you will see that uh, I answer all the questions he posed. <laughs> Apparently, he just didn't get it, which is amazing, isn't it? That, that little old me would do this. And he has the whole world convinced he's the greatest scientist that ever lived, and he didn't know what was going on. But he posed the right questions. It's just that it wasn't until now that someone actually answered. So that's what the book is there for. And you can get a free PDF off of my website, foosresearch.com. You can find the PDF book. It's free. Nobody's trying to make money off of this, but there is a hardcover copy available on Amazon should you want one. And if I were to be able to convey to people the importance of this discovery, <laughs> will there be millions of people wanting it? I'm just not, I just need your help. That's all, I just need your help. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you know, this big bang, because obviously if, if space is expanding in its cosmic sense and rulers are shrinking and growing depending upon the gravitational strength around them on the average for the universe as a whole, it's fixed. There's no big bang. It, on that level of space, we're not talking about distance between reasons, we're talking about a different level of space in outer dimension as well as an inner dimension into which physical space is expanding. And that's proof Brown grip is proof of that. I didn't make it up. So there was no big bang. <laughs> it doesn't seem rational, does it? That things could expand indefinitely for an eternity. Or you could look backwards and they could have been doing it for an eternity that things could shrink and swell in that way. But if you think about it, the proof is there. That actually is true. That's actually how the universe expands. It's been, it will expand for an eternity. Okay, what, are, what is this expansion that the physicists are talking about? They correctly, incorrectly refer to the fixed distances of stars within the galaxy as gravitational redshift. We know that it's a cosmic expansion, but, but there is no change in distance as far as they're concerned. But on the intergalactic level, they correlate the redshift between galaxies over much, much longer distances with measurable distances by using what are called standard candles or levels of brightness. So they're saying, yeah, Obviously, there's a change in distance correlating with this redshift, and therefore the universe, the raisins are moving farther apart. And so, you know, you can rationalize this backwards, interpolate this backwards to a big bang at some point. And, <clears throat> you know, they come up with all these convoluted theories about the distance of the expansion. No, 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 no. Remember that the universe as a whole is expanding at an accelerating rate. It's expanding at the incremental rate of C. Not our local C, actually, because the speed of light does vary depending upon the um, mass density or uh, mass density or its inverse throughout the universe. So as you move towards an area of more concentrated mass, the speed of light increases. And the rate of expansion is increasing. As a matter of fact, the rate of expansion is the greatest near black holes. That's why there's such an intense blue shift. As light is approaching, it's being pushed back. Its waves are being squeezed together. The rate of expansion is so great there. And it's capturing bodies around it because they're not expanding as fast. It's just that we see it the opposite of what actually is happening. So this little incremental increase in the rate of expansion is 
so minuscule we don't see it on the galactic level well for one thing it diminishes with very quickly as you get away from a body of mass you know that newton's law inverse law square of the radius it diminishes with the square of the radius and the fractional and, and since everything is expanding at one time we're not going to see that internally inside of our box however if you'll think about it if the universe as a whole is expanding incrementally at the speed of light as we see it inside the, our, of our box then the actual rate of expansion and volume of the universe on the cosmic level outside the box if we were looking outside if we were looking from outside is enormous beyond anything we can possibly imagine but it's increasing the rate of expansion is increasing at the rate of the speed of light every second and that actually will show up it will begin to surface just a tiny fraction on the intergalactic level over many billions of years that's what they're measuring they're not measuring the distance between the raisins they're the light is telling them just like it's telling us locally that that the universe is expanding on the cosmic level the light is telling them this is the incremental rate of expansion over billions and billions of years the actual expansion is much much more than that but that's why they think the raisins the distance between the raisins is expanding and it's not it just correlates that way because it would the light isn't lying to you it's telling you the difference in rates of expansion between any two points faithfully it's just this little tiny fractional increase because of the acceleration of expansion after you know you get a little distance away you know it amounts to nothing it's it's not visible but on the intergalactic level from very billions and over billions of years you will see that and so that's what they're telling that's they're measuring the actual incremental accumulated incremental increase in the rate of expansion of the universe as a whole not the internal fixed dimension so there was no big bang This may be a little difficult to understand or to explain it to, you know, to someone who hasn't heard of it before. But if you're smart enough, you have enough math and science behind you, you'll see that I'm telling you exactly, I'm giving it to you straight. This isn't my idea, it isn't a hypothesis. It's the fact. It's what the experiments are telling you. It's rational inference that is safe that is secure that is true and no well maybe that's why i haven't got any comments people either can't understand it or don't want to understand it or they're scared to say anything because especially if you're if you're feeding from the government trough you know you know you won't have a job tomorrow if you start thinking for yourself so that's the gift that i want to leave the world that's what I want to give to you. It's this special understanding, the special illumination. Uh, there's one other thing that I want to mention here, and that is the value of G, Newton's gravitational constant. Let's not call it Einstein's cosmological constant. What a what a plagiarist he was. What a travesty. What an injustice to a great man. But if we take a look at the units of G, and there are different ways of constructing these units, uh, R cubed over mass, or length cubed over mass times, or divided by second squared. That's how it's commonly, but it doesn't make any sense that way. But G is a meaningful value. It isn't a fudge factor. It isn't just some units you throw in there and you come up with an experiment to make it work. That's what they do with it. And it's wrong. G has a very special meaning. 
it has the three fundamental immutable constants of the universe embodied in the value of big G. And if you take one of the units of length off and you reconstruct this formula correctly, you'll find that G is equal to the radius of the universe squared. That makes sense, doesn't it? We're talking about mass density or the inverse, uh, what do they call it? Specific volume, okay. Divided by mass of the universe. So it might be possible if you, you might be possible to come out with a, not what the physicists are doing or cosmologists, but you might actually be able to come out with a, a correct value of radius of the universe, fixed radius of the universe and fixed mass of the universe. These are immutable constants of the universe. And that leaves you with C over S, the speed of light per second, which means the acceleration of light. So the universe is three things. It's a certain volume within which there's a certain fixed mass as we see it, okay, internally, it's always the same. R squared divided by mass, radius of universe squared divided by mass, times the acceleration of light. Because what's important here isn't just the fact that things are drifting apart, but they're, the acceleration is what is required to sustain the force of gravity. And every particle of mass has its own acceleration. The universe as a whole has its own acceleration that produces a force of gravity, which is proportional to the total mass of the universe. And you might be able to actually come out with the right figures if you do this right. So, and G will vary. See, we're assuming here, you know, Newton was saying, you know, this is assuming a uniform mass density or specific volume throughout the universe. We know that isn't true. We got deep space over here. We've got a black hole over here. And so big G is not going to be equal at all. Play. You know, the ambient mass over a very large region is actually going to dictate the force of gravity and the speed of light. Well, let's take a look. The acceleration light is equal to um, uh, mass divided by the radius squared. The density of mass in a certain, the speed of light is proportional to the density of mass. So as you approach a black hole, well, you're going to slow down because you're going to be meeting the expansion of space if you're if you're actually traveling a line, but you're not really a photon blasted out of a cannon anyway. The expansion of space from all directions is going to determine at what velocity and what direction that light moves. And so let's not use the term black hole as, but you know, let's, let's just say a, a body of great mass is going to have an intense blue shift for light approaching it in an intense red shift in the opposite direction of light moving away from it because it's expanding at a very rapid rate. And the value of G, we know, um, is gonna depend on a very large region in space, maybe hundreds of millions of, of planets or stars. Just that overall region in there will dictate actually what G will be and it'll vary a little bit from place to place. That's right, look at the equation, of course it will. And I'm sure the experiments reflect that. So as you travel along as a beam of light, I guess, a wave of light, you know, you approach, a, approach a, an area of extreme mass density, you're going to slow down, but the overall speed of light within that area is going to be much greater. And of course, when you pass the midpoint, you're going to shoot off like a bat out of hell because the expansion is extremely great. And the reverse of that, we perceive of as gravity. So a black hole has an intense gravitational force. <laughs> Come on, it, it might sound like I'm rambling on. Now go back, step through this, okay? This is the truth, it's a fact.
These are facts. I didn't make this up, but it's my idea. You have to think about it, think about it, think it through. Anyway, so that's Newton's G. And um, if a gravitational potential is even, of course, as the velocity of light speeds up and slows down, depending on mass density, the Michelson and Morley experiment had everything, you know, they, they put it in a vat of mercury, so it was perfectly level, of course, okay? Yeah, because if it's not, you know, the mass density will vary somewhat and the speed of light won't be exactly the same in all directions, right? That's why they put it in the back vat of mercury. It's so that everything is at an equal gravitational potential, a uniform mass density. But it couldn't be, right? Because there's a moon out there and the moon is going to... is space is going to be expanding a little bit this way. No matter how you rig it, you know, it's going to vary a little bit. So you know they lied a little bit. It just can't possibly be true that it was perfectly, perfectly the same in all directions, but it was close enough, you know, for them to say that, oh, oh, we proved Einstein again. But anyway, okay, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, aren't I? I just have to keep trying to get your attention that I have solved this problem. I've given you a correct answer. I've given you the holy grail of physics, or of cosmology anyway, haven't I? At least one step farther than Newton. And I don't pretend to be smarter than Newton. I'm just a really, really, really good mathematical problem solver. And the last half of my book, you know, is about solving a statistical problem. And I'm juggling, it's just com very complicated algebra, but I was able to see this truth deeply into the problem. And I mentioned this to my instructor and he said, no, no, that's that, you know, you, it's not true. And so I went and I proved it to him. But for a formal proof, I had to prove it not only for K equals one or K equals two, but for K equals two plus one. And the equations get extremely long. And I just wanted to show you that I could do that. And actually it's, it's a useful, um, there are some useful concepts, not just statistically, but in measuring uh, uh, gradients and such in space. And, you know, there, there are various uses for it, determining whether or not there was uh, any real change difference between the votes for Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump or something. <laughs> this, I'm not a Trumpist, okay? I'm not trying to make any kind of political statements here at all, but they are lying to you. And if they're lying to you about this, they're lying to you about a lot of other things. And of course, you're probably smart enough to figure that out. I'm not telling you anything new. I'm not lying to you about everything. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm not an Alex Jones. I'm not <laughs> some complaints, but I don't want to go there. I want to talk about this. I want to, I want for risking my risking death to pay for that education and working as hard as I did without even a place to live at times. And almost literally starving and, and being extremely ill and unable to seek any help. You know, that's what I, the sacrifices I had to make for that education. I want something to come of it. I want, and I wouldn't be telling you this if I wasn't 100% certain of it. Now, I want you to be able to see it for yourself. So go back over it and, um, Okay, I got something special for you now, and uh, I hope you get a laugh out of it, and I will see you later. Hopefully, this is the last video I'll have to do, and you know, this is one that will break it. Okay, go well, have a good night. I'll see you later. It's like the police have got a dead body on the floor, and there's a man in front of them holding a knife covered in blood. <laughs> with a T-shirt that says, it was me. <laughs> I killed him, and they're like, I don't know, I'm not seeing it. <laughs>
never sung a song before with seven equations? Raise your hand.